Hello. Finding this place was quite the challenge. Oh, was it? <laughs> How many times did you pass it? Oh, That's only about question. five. Only five? Yeah. <laughs> and finally, even my GPS kept telling me that I was there. Oh, really? Kept telling me I had arrived. Well, and you I had kept arrived at a I'm bank. Here, but we're here. <laughs> Jules is coming. Hi, Ron. How are you? Jules, I'm here with that annoying camera again. How are you doing? You are. I think, you know, I've been in love with movies all my life. And uh, my inspiration for the story are old black and white noir movies like Double Indemnity and Maltese Falcon Ooh. and uh, the movies that I watched endlessly as a very young child when I was plopped in front of the TV because my parents had other things to do and they wanted me out of their way and uh, when I was a kid there, there was the, a show on TV that was called Million Dollar Movie and now I'm dating myself but it would, it would come on every afternoon and uh, and I was, I would religiously sit there and uh, and watch. And later on, you know, when I got grew up a, a little bit and, and went to high school, I, I had a rule. Um, you couldn't go to school on Monday because that was the day after the weekend. <laughs> so I would go to school on Tuesdays. And then, of course, you couldn't go to school two days in a row. So I wouldn't go to school on Wednesday. And uh, then Thursday, of course, I had to go to school because, you know, it was every other day. And then Friday was the day before the weekend, and you couldn't go to school on the day before the weekend, so I wouldn't go to school on Friday. And I did that for nine months before I got home. Uh, and where I went, every day that I didn't go to school was to the movies. So... Uh, Somehow the movies are deeply ingrained in my consciousness and very much in my heart. And that is how this story begins, which is there are two people drawn to one another. They couldn't be more wrong for one another and they have disaster written all over them. But somehow they are compelled to follow through with whatever is going to happen to them. I was a managing editor of a new magazine. The introductory issue had been a great success. While I worked diligently to make it so, the aging publisher's latest girlfriend, La Diva of the cocaine-induced blowjob, who serviced him assiduously from beneath his desk each day during lunch, licked her lips sweetly and demanded my job. There was no contest. After receiving the news, and since we were at the start of the new season, I was left little choice but to meet with the editor of our rival publication. Michael Ashforth was a tall wasp in his fifties, balding ever so slightly, his remaining hair graying silently. He wore a salt and pepper mustache reminiscent of the 1970s that he kept neatly trimmed. When he sat cross-legged, you could see that he had a little bit of a paunch. He examined my resume like a doctor reading a chart, while I sat across from him in an uncomfortable, cool-to-the-touch, middle-school wooden chair. He peered through the wire-framed pharmacy reading glasses that made him look like an intellectual, while his elegant, tapered fingers gently fondled the sheets of paper resting on his knee. I quietly waited for him to finish, feeling demoted and pretending not to care. When he was done, we made small talk, discussed the weather, where and how long I'd lived in the Hamptons, and then the conversation took a more personal turn. Where had I grown up and was I married? I explained that New York City had been my home for most of my life, that I was divorced and childless. As it turned out, we were the same age, and we had both grown up in the city. Coincidentally, his uncle's townhouse was on the same street as my childhood home. 
since we appear to be heading down that road, I asked about the photograph of the attractive young girl above his desk. With a note of pride in his voice, he announced that she was his daughter and the love of his life. He made no mention of a wife. I checked for a wedding bed. None. No other photos. Not even, even a smiling group shot complete with cats and dogs posed on the front lawn. I reminded myself that I was there to pitch my stories. I offered each one as if it were a delectable, handmade chocolate morsel on a silver tray. Energetically, I presented every article I had planned for my own magazine for the season. He devoured them, saying yes to each and smiling greedily. He explained that I would be standing in for a writer who was on vacation for the summer. But there was something in his manner, something intangible, something electric, simmering beneath the surface. The deal made, we stood up to shake hands and say goodbye, when he gently brushed a loose strand of hair from my right eye. His phone calls and emails commenced the next day. After all, we had a professional relationship. I was the new writer and had to be nurtured. Jokingly, I requested to be sent to The Hague to cover the war crimes trials of, of deposed despots. His response was, only if he could go with me. Assigned to cover a gallery opening, I asked whether he'd care to accompany me there. He politely declined. But by the time I returned from viewing the exhibition, Eight phone messages were waiting in my voicemail. Hi, I um, uh, was thinking of you and thought I'd say hello. Click. All my life, it's, I had successfully employed a policy to never fool around with the men I worked with, particularly if those men were married and especially if those men were in positions of power. But the sky was making it difficult. A haze of ambiguity surrounded the risks involved in becoming lovers. The fact that doing so might cause me to lose my job, which I desperately needed, versus my turning him down, which also might cause me to lose my job, added a certain relish to the mix. I was rushed off my feet by excitation and flattery, imagining what he stood to lose if we were caught. My last relationship had ended over a year ago, and I did not care for one night stands. Instead, I chose to spend time on creative projects or activities like dinner and movies with friends. The transition from magazine editor to freelance writer also left me with more time on my hands than I was accustomed to having. To my surprise, I discovered that I was lonely and hungry for attention. His constant calls not only gave my ego a buzz, but reawakened my sensuality, exposing in their wake a voracious hunger for sexual intimacy. The strength of his order made me realize just how parched I had become. There was no question. He was offering himself to me as a very willing drink of water, slightly toxic perhaps, but water nevertheless.